All right, it is Friday, April 22nd. Welcome to the Rowdy.com Big Three. I'm Buzz Cutler, sitting next to real live race car driver J.J. Yaley. It's been a while. It's, it's been a couple weeks. Have, are you wearing your belt buckle? No. Let me answer that. I don't have a belt on. Uh huh. Okay. Do you have your belt buckle on? I don't. All right, then. Well, then. I you are yours, I, I'll wear mine. I guess we're even <laughs> then. Um, I want to start off by talking to you about Talladega, because it was some weirdness in the 46 team from what we could see. And here's what I understand. You tell me if I'm right. You guys go to Talladega expecting to get an engine from ECR. Correct. And they ran out, and you guys got left holding the bag. Okay. I mean, is that what ha- is that basically uh, what More happened? or less. You know, we had been working on trying to get an engine um, after Daytona. You know, obviously, we, the 46 team had ECR engines in the last year. Uh, they qualified 15th at Talladega in full race package. A- and we knew that, uh, you know, the engines we've been getting this year from Ernie have been fr- have been really, really good. Uh, the intermediate engines, a lot of power, a lot of torque. You know, maybe still not that of uh, ECR or even what uh, you know some of the Hendrick guys are, but very, very good. You know, obviously, we're still capable of qualifying, uh, you know, in the middle of the pack pretty easily. You know, the the cost is obviously a lot better for our team to get those engines. Uh, you know, the, it takes money in order to really have a really good restricted plate engine, the time and effort that goes into it. It was either take that car, put an engine in it that was going to be marginal on speed and hope that we make the race, or option B, uh, which Bill Elliott was kind enough to come over. Uh, we used his name on the uh, the, the entry blank on the entry blank, right. and we're gonna go with Bill uh, qualifying the car. You know, we had hoped that the car was gonna be fast enough to qualify in, and then it would have lessened the confusion moving on into Sunday. So, you know, the way everything worked out, it worked out in our favor. You know, if I would qualified the car, we would have had engine problems. The car would have been way off speed. We'd have missed the race. So, so because he used his champion's provisional. He was obligated to take the green flag. Correct. Okay. Didn't realize that. So um, wow, there's something we trumped you on. Way to go! Yeah, you had well, to start reading up. Now, when you step into a um, in a relief mode, when you jump into a car that's already been you know out on the track, you didn't take the green flag. Is that a different mindset for you? A different deal, or is it just still uh, pretty much the same thing as if you had taken the green flag yourself? It's pretty much the same as normal. You know, for for me, uh, luckily enough, other than Bill being a lot taller than I am, uh, you, you know the the cockpit was built for me. It was, it was, nothing was changed from when I drove this car last. So, you know, Bill just had to kind of make do with his legs being cramped up a little bit more. Uh, the, where the steering wheel location was, was good for both of us. So, you know, really there was no big change other than him jumping out, me jumping in. You know, I worked a lot of the race with Terry Labonte and the 32 team. And that was kind of planned from the get go. We had the same radio communication. Uh, that was the only car that I had on my radio. So, you know, when we worked two thirds of the race together, it was really, really nice knowing that once I came up into a pack of cars and they're three wide and there's nowhere to go and you've got a closing rate and you're running 50 mile an hour faster, that I could get on my radio and say, you know, we need to check up. His spotter here is it and we're immediately slowing down. After the 32 blew an engine, I was working with Travis a little bit and we were in the same situation where we're coming up into a pack of cars where there's nowhere for me to lead us into. And I'm on the brakes, off the gas, sideways, trying to get him to stop pushing. You know, and that time it takes my spotter to find his spotter, start waving, letting him know that, you know, obviously I need to check up some. That distance is, is that buffer zone of safety. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, it, it's safe and it's unsafe. I think that there's enough drivers out there that had enough radio communication with enough teams that you can work well with each other. And, and the racing actually is kind of fun. Just as long as you got a partner. I mean, if you get stuck out there by yourself, it, it's so miserable. Yeah, I heard some drivers say they liked it because you're not going to have the big chain reaction wreck as a result of a huge pack. And then Matt Kens is saying he hated it because as a pusher, he couldn't see anything. And so he felt like he didn't have any control over his own fate. So I, I heard both of those, uh, both sides of the story espoused by different drivers. And really, there's, a, there's more to the pairing of the cars than, than a lot of people realize. You know, I think that's what happened in the big accident that happened on the nationwide race and something that I learned at Daytona. You know, if, if you have a average car, I- engine, whatever the package may be, and then you have a really, really good car pushing you, the, the difference is that car is trying to push you so much faster than your car really wants to go. So now all of a sudden, you know, I'm referring to the Mike Wallace accident. You know, obviously they borrowed a car from James Finch that had a good race car, maybe not a very good engine. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have Elliott Sadler shoved him, who's got the best, you know, one of the best cars out there. And just the difference of 
pushing a car that doesn't want to be pushed that fast. And all of a sudden, you watch that car, and it's a lot squirrelier in a two-car draft because he's just trying to push that car out of the road versus pushing it in the direction it wants to go. If you find two cars that are more evenly matched, it seems to be a better pairing to where it's easier to stay in line. You don't have as much movement with the cars. I, and I noticed the same thing even at Talladega with me and, and Terry. The two of us, I mean, never had any issues. You know, I could change lanes anytime I wanted to. He could move out and get air like he needed to being a pusher. It, it never really upset the handling of my car. That's interesting because you, you saw Kurt Busch take out Dave Blaney and Landon Castle, wondering maybe if that's a little bit of what was going on there. The Penske was a little too strong for T Tommy Baldwin or, uh, or Phoenix. And it could be, and obviously I'm referring more to the nationwide because right. there's a, a bigger split a bigger, right. amongst the, the vehicles. But it sometimes it just shows that there's really a lot to that pairing of finding that perfect match because everyone's cows are different. There's just a way that the air flows over the cars that, you know, just like Dale Jr. said, his car was a lot faster pushing Jimmy Johnson versus the other way around. Even though those cars come from the same stable, they're built off the same jigs, um, you know, everything is done in lasers anymore. So you'd think those two cars or that team would be specifically almost identical, and and there was a difference. All right. J.J. Yaley, driver of the number 46 Whitney Motorsports. Redline Chevrolet. Redline Chevrolet. <laughs> Thanks for having my back. <laughs> <laughs> Helping us to uh, further understand what went down in Talladega. Thanks for watching. Rowdy.com. Say it like it is. Say what like it is. Rowdy.com. Rowdy